What episode are we on? Uh, we're on 10, or we're oh. sort of on 9B, if we want to call it that. Okay, well then, this, this will be the awkward opening bit before the actual theme song comes on, which is right about now. What's up, everybody, and welcome to episode 10 of the Lunar Observer. We've, re we've reached double digits now. And not only that, if you notice, the sound quality has mysteriously improved. Yes, because, and the reaction time, because we are now in the same location. And yes. that location is live, for us at least, from PSX, PlayStation Experience, in San Francisco. Yeah, we are actually on the third floor, the panel area of PlayStation Experience. So if you hear a lot of background noise, we do apologize in advance. This is an open area where people can walk around and have lunch in. There's yeah. big Luck tables where people can eat. Yeah, luckily we're recording after the SingStar section. <laughs> yes, there was a SingStar competition down below, and it was um, enlightening. Yes. That's the word I'd use. Yeah. So we're basically recording this because we were talking about Ratchet and Clank a lot, and obviously we have the demo down below, and yeah, we just wanted to record what we were thinking about here. First off, the demo at PSX, Pokitaru is playable! Yeah, it is, it is. Um, and yeah, it's not sort of um, Pokitaru on top of everything else or anything, it's um, Illyro City slash Metropolis, because the city is... the. The city is no longer called Metropolis, the, uh, the planet is. We've got um, Nebula G34, which is BTS, and we got Pokitaru. Yeah, and we also got to watch gameplay of Velden today at the keynote. Yeah, we did, um, which came right after the movie, and um, we'll get into this with the uh, in-depth gallery, but um, this is where I do some editing, hopefully, maybe not, hi. <laughs> um, there was a, we'll get into this with the gallery, but um, there was actually a screenshot from way, way back, which was of Ratchet um, fighting one of those dropships, and I, I figured, well, that's got to be Velden, right after he rescues Clank, because it's at night, it's rather um, arid where he is, and it's an up your arsenal reference, because at the end of that level, Ratchet also fought a dropship with rock cover. <laughs> yes, because they were using that to teach your strafing, and I'm going to guess that that's the point of it here, yeah. because strafing is in people. PS4 Ratchet and Clank. Of course. It's, it's a modern Ratchet game. You can't not have it. Yeah. So it's identical to that up your arsenal level. Yeah, in terms of the actual oh. boss fight mechanics and yeah. the layout. So it's really teaching new players how to strafe, yeah. which is really cool. That and they it, It's a little nod to people who've played it before. Yeah. Also, um, the swing shot orb. So Ratchet definitely for sure, for real, starts with the swing shot, and that's probably where they learn how to use it as well. Yes. So the swing shot he gets he gets from the very beginning as well as his wrench. Um, we are not still sure if he has if Clank has helipack from the beginning. No. Um, you guys may have seen this through like uh, online gameplay videos from other sites like IGN, Kotaku, Eurogamer, obscure website from Germany, that sort of thing. Um, but at the end of the Pokitaru level um, is when you get to Owl. And um, the reason why you get to Owl at the end of Pokitaru, who's there for a comic convention, as it turns out, um, is so that his um, Galactic Ranger ship can be upgraded with the capabilities for dogfighting. Yep, so he doesn't get a new ship for dogfighting, and his existing ship can't dogfight to begin with, which means that that Metropolis dogfight that we see in the trailers is very likely much later in the game and not in the original time you go to, uh, to Metropolis. Correction, actually. The dogfight in Metropolis, if you notice, it's Ratchet's ship from Velden. Right, it is. It's the ramshackle ship before it breaks apart. Yeah, exactly. So Ratchet probably crashes it at some point. Oh, actually, yes, um, we do see him actually crashing, and then immediately after, Court gives him his new ship. Well, we don't know if it's immediately after. Well, there could be some time involved. In the, in the same in level. In the same yes. level, yes. So, yeah, you lose the dogfighting and you pick it up in Pukitaru. But the interesting thing, if you've seen the cutscene, Ratchet and Al talk as if they've met before. And they're talking about Korra. So they've definitely not only met before, it seems like Al does ship repair for all of the all of the Rangers. Yeah, probably. Um, Which yeah. means he's not up at uh, he's not improving Clank. 
That is not his purpose. Actually, well, what if the, the previous time they met was for Clank to get his helipack upgrade? Or a, or a, something else. They yeah, met I was going to say they've met before. Um, I was going to say the the jetpack, but we know where that comes from. Yeah. Also interesting about Pogitaru, I noticed. Um, I do the sort of exploration thing instead of following the main path. Right from the start, I went to the right, which is where the teleporter would be to go down to the Pogitaru scenic sewers. Instead, there was a pad with um, a red... Um, I can't remember what the icon was, but it was a red icon, and when I stepped on top of it, I got a subtitle saying, Needs Thruster Pack. Yep. So it's, oh, it's the, um, the icon is of the wings of the, um... The Thruster Pack. The Thruster Pack, yeah, so... I'm guessing that, um, you... That might be because they haven't visited Gaspar yet, because in the original game, Pokitaro and Gaspar are quite close to each yeah. other in terms of the level order. Wait, now I didn't see this because I can't read the text off their screens. Did it say Thruster Pack or did it say Jet Pack? Thruster Pack, very specifically. Huh. Yeah. That's an interesting twist. Yeah, so I'm thinking that the Thruster Pack is the new name for the Levitator, and you can't use the Thruster Pack like in the original Ratchet and Clank in the classic game. So, mm. sorry guys. Yeah, because it's very clearly a gelatonium area where you can ch charge uh, fill that um, meter. Yeah, um, I don't know why you would need the Thruster Pack because the ship can dogfire. I can't think of any areas you can visit. Maybe stuff that's too narrow for your ship to enter? Maybe. Or... A possible example is um, the scenic sewers are there, but the teleporter won't actually let you use it until you have the thruster pack, which you need to navigate the sewers, similar to what you did on um, planet Silox when you uh, cleared out the waterworks and then right. you used the jet pack. And into the Nexus. Yeah, exactly. That would be really fun. That would be really cool. I loved that level. Now, on a different note, I'm going to say one, one negative I had with Pokitaru. Um, ran out of ammo. I ran out of ammo fighting the um, the giant floating squid because he appears not once but twice mm -hmm. right at the end of the level right before you meet Al. Uh, his first appearance was also um, not present in a demo. He normally appears right before you get onto the skiff at the beginning. Yep. yep. So he's there too. And by that point, I was down to very little ammo. Now, granted, I only had um, one weapon wheel. Yeah. And normally not having a lot of ammo when you get there is not a bad thing. But... But he floats. And the, comic stri the comet strike of your wrench isn't far enough to reach him. Oh. I thought the problem was that there was no respawning ammo. There wasn't any respawning ammo either. That to me is the big one. Yeah. So not only can your Comet Strike not reach, if you run out of ammo and shooting ammo, so like the drum won't work, and we'll get to the drum in a moment, um, you're kind of screwed. Yeah, and you can't use the Grooviton on him either because it doesn't actually go off when it hits him. It goes off when it hits solid ground. And then floats up in the air. Yeah. And that and the solid, he floats around your platform. So if you throw it on um, if you throw it on the ground and, he f and it floats up in the air, it doesn't have wide enough range to reach him. Now, granted, we are playing Pokitaru on fixed weapon levels. They were all level two. So I have a feeling you can always go back and level up your weapons and this problem will be solved. Yeah. But as it stood, with no rare titanium upgrades and only level two weapons, I couldn't beat the level. Now, I have a feeling Pokitaru is far enough, because he was in his ranger armor, that we're not going to be at level two weapons at that point. So I think it's going to be moot. But mm -hmm. when I played it, I could not physically beat the level. Yeah, well, I think any bad player can grind themselves through a level. Yeah. But running out of ammo is a frustrating problem because in if you're a bad player, in the sense that you just aren't skilled enough, say a seven-year-old, running out of ammo is actually a big problem because the Blagian Snaggle Beast fight does have respawning ammo in it. Yes. I have, I have a feeling that one of two things is going to happen. Um, Pokitaro is probably a recently finished level, and that might be something that they're still working on. Yeah, we've only seen it recently. So yeah, it's very sense. recent, so it's entirely possible that they'll stick some more ammo there. A. B. They gave us weapons that are vastly under-leveled for what you'd actually have there, even even being um, even being um, yeah. conservative. Yeah, most of the weapons um, provided were pretty good, were it not for the fact that they had a couple of aspects that made them not useful. So, for example, the combustor and the buzz blades weren't really that viable in most scenarios because they fired very slowly. 
They did, because they, again, they were only level two, and I'm assuming they had no raritanium upgrades. No, there was no hint yeah. of raritanium, and there were no vendors either. Yeah, so we were stuck with what was given to us. I have a feeling that by that point in the game, that you have stronger weapons than level two, that you have more than what we received, that's B, and and C is that you've got raritanium. So yeah. I don't think that's going to be a problem when you're fighting. Now, um, the other half of it is, is that drum that I was referring to. That's yeah, the proton is, drum. Yeah, a brand new weapon. Another brand new weapon other than the pixelator. By the way, the pixelator is awesome. Yeah, yeah. Just going to say that right now. We're running a bit low on time because we uh, we have to get to the kind of funny meet and greet. So, so we're going to wrap this up real quick. Yeah, um, talking about the uh, proton bomb. Yeah. So um, do you mind if I start and then you pick up with anything? Anything I've missed? Yeah, sure. All right, so first off, the Proton Bomb is sort of this game's rift inducer in that it is a, um, a sphere that sits in one place, very much like the rift, um, and affects a range around it. The difference is, is it doesn't draw things to it, it creates a shockwave around it in a in a sort of arc. Yeah, it makes yeah a shockwave in a pulse, and it beats like a drum. Yeah, exactly. Probably proton drum beats that sort of thing. Um, and at level two, um, what is interesting about it and being on Pokitaro specifically, I think that it's a weapon that you're going to be able to buy on Pokitaro. And why yeah. do I think that? Because um, when we were playing, um, we went onto the skiff level and. Since we've played these games before, we figured that it was a high likelihood that those uh, pufferfish or puffoids, or, or yeah, I think they're called puffoids, that they'd appear on the boat and start attacking the boat driver, who in this case is not Grimroth. Yeah, <laughs> um, which Ratchet actually calls out with the uncanny resemblance. Yeah. Um, and. Yeah, in the original game, there wasn't really any weapon that was best suited to it. I mean, yeah, the... Um, the I decoy, usually just use the wrench. Yeah, the decoy glove is um, good for drawing them away. and But it's really, you want the Tesla claw, but you don't yeah. have it at that point. And the pyrocitus, the flames are actually affected by your trajectory and your movement. Yeah. But, and I did this completely without realizing it. If you toss the um, proton bomb, drum then it is really, really good at taking out the enemies because it's, it's sort of like a turret almost. And the pulses and the electric energy arcs, the electric sparks coming out from it, pretty much, pretty handily took care of the, the fish. And it felt exactly like the classic thing that Ratchet and Clank 1 used to do where you would get a new weapon at the vendor and the level is designed around teaching you how to use that weapon properly because you had to use it. Yeah. For example, um, in Metropolis, you get the blaster right when you encounter enemies like the helicopter where you have to use the blaster. Yeah. In um, Blackwater City, you pick up the Devastator to deal with those tanks. Um, in Gimlick Base, you don't... You got it earlier, but that's pretty much like you need to have the visible at this point, or else you're stuffed. Yeah. Altanus, and then Altanus the Tesla call. Yeah, exactly. And this felt exactly like a class, an example of that. My favorite is actually um, Gaspar with the Walloper, Walloper to deal with those uh, bomb drones. Yeah. So the fact that Insomnia Car is doing that again is, to me, is actually exciting because that makes the game more interesting when you play it. And a lot of the time when I pick up new weapons, I just sort of discard them because I've got other weapons to upgrade it and they're not that powerful. They're probably not going to be that powerful in a couple of levels, so I may as well get them out of the way while I can. Yeah. Ergo, I don't really use the other weapons that much until much later. This gives me a reason to use them now. Yeah. And not only that, but even at level two, the proton drum, when you threw it on that skiff, you had to stand on the back of the skiff and basically throw it towards not Grimroth. Yeah. And if you did that... In the middle. Yeah, in the middle. Because if you threw it from one side to the other, it would fall into the water and you'd be stuffed. Yeah. Good um, for close, small battlegrounds. Yeah. But um, as those fish came onto the boat, they'd, they'd be hit by the drum from yeah. any of the directions, and you would just pick up all the bolts. It yeah. was a really great way of teaching you how to use that weapon. Mm. And it's an excuse for you to level it up quickly right then and there. Yeah, exactly. You get a bit of motivation. I yeah. wouldn't be surprised if level one... The level one upgrade was um, quick, like with the Omni Blaster and into the Nexus, just to demonstrate your weapon gets better. Yeah. And with the Proton Bomb, you get sort of a basic version, and then level two might add a perk, like the um, electrocution stuff, to show you, uh, hey, your weapon's just got even more useful. Keep using it. Yeah. We don't know how that weapon leveling is going to be. Is it going to be like, um, say, um, 
into the Nexus where it's just damage and then your rare Titanium is where you get all the specials. That's what I'm assuming, but we'll find out soon enough. Yeah. What do you think the V5 upgrade will be? Um, I think that the uh, drum will draw things in. Yeah, as it's I think beating. so as well because there's very clearly some sort of energy inside it's the a pulse. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, it, sort of like this, that uh, pink light inside the uh, orb that opens up very similar to the Agorian's maces actually from uh, A Crank in Time. Yeah, it looks a bit like the Agorian's mace without the dots. Like, you know how it's like this sort yeah, of spike? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it looks very similar to that. I'm thinking that whatever is in there will start sucking enemies in, which yeah. will make it very, very useful. And that's why I made that comparison earlier to the um, brain farting. Tornado launcher? No, the the um, up your arsenal weapon that I was mentioning earlier, the rift, rift inducer. inducer. There we go. Yeah. Um, and on that note, because not one but two insomniacs called me out on it, I'd also like to take a slight detour and apologize for calling your game Edge of Tomorrow. I was on three hours of sleep and a little bit stressed. It's Edge of Nowhere, guys. I am so sorry. To be fair, Ratchet and Clank getting Edge of Tomorrow would be pretty funny. That would be hilarious given the time travel. And oh, we're getting yells again from downstairs. They're starting another tournament. Yeah. So I think it's um, what is it? Parappa the Rapper and and um, Twisted Middle Black. Yeah, speaking of, um, I'm so excited for all the PS2 games. And on that note, they very clearly said in the keynote, it is not pop your PS2 disc into the PS4. It wasn't, it wasn't the keynote where they said that. It was the trailer for it that we watched this morning. Correct. So, um... They're definitely reselling the games, but in my opinion, that's not too bad because people who have kept the PS2 games is going to be very unlikely and they're so old. Hi. Yeah, well, I've kept all my <laughs> PS2 games as well. But, you know, they're certainly going to be far cheaper than they were when you bought them new. They're, they said that the price points are either going to be $9.99 um, or $14.99. Yeah, depending on the game. Depending on the game. And all the $14.99 games will have trophies. Yep. The $9.99 ones are dependent on the game. So check your game if trophies are important to you. Yeah, because um, the trophies are made in collaboration with the original developers. Yes. If Ratchet and Clank pops up, I wouldn't be surprised if they just copied the trophies from the HT collection. But hey, that means you can have three sets of trophies from the same game but the original three you can have trophies from the PS3 version the Vita version and the PS4 port <laughs> and not only that it also means the original trilogy would be on PS4 which would be kind of cool I've got to tell you having played we got a chance to play a bunch of those PS2 up res games yeah they are the definition of being ported they are emulated PS2 games with a couple of enhancements they are a few enhancements they're all at 1080p there's better anti-aliasing there's better anti-aliasing Frame rate. Frame rate's much cleaner. I was playing Dark Cloud and you were playing... War of the Monsters, baby. Yes. And unfortunately for the people who are PSX, I'm so sorry for breaking the antique sword. I did not hear it beeping before it broke. So um, we at PSX have all been collectively trying to beat Dark Cloud. Yeah, yeah. Most of the game was unlocked by, by the time you played it. I thought, when I, when I stepped up to it, I'm like, oh, they just opened up the whole area for people to explore. And they're like, no, we just played the actual game. And over the course of one day, they're at the moon base. Yeah. Which is like in the last leg of the game. And there's only one demo as well, and it's facing away from the main walkway area. You so. wouldn't even know it was there. So these are people specifically spe seeking out Dark Cloud to play it. And that's what I'm seeing all day, is fans from everywhere coming here to play games that they enjoy. Mm. Yeah. On that note, we're going to call it night. Yeah. We'll probably jump over to the next segment. But for us, we, we are going to head over to the uh, Kind of Funny Meet and Greet. Yep. So, yeah, see you after this uh, intermissive break that lasts five seconds. In a world where video game movies never seem to get off the ground, one franchise has the proper ratio of humor, references, and dashing good looks to actually make it into theaters. Ratchet and Clank, coming to your galaxy this April. Well, we're back, and now we're in the um, hotel room on uh, just after day two of um, PSX. So it's all over now, and oh no! No! <laughs> uh, by the way, amazing! If you can get yourself out here next year, highly recommended. That's assuming that it's still going to be in San Francisco. 
why you think they're going to move to another because they were in Las Vegas last year, weren't they? Yeah, they were. I mean, I would assume that it's still in San Francisco for next time, but there's still I wouldn't be surprised if they moved it to a new location. But I yeah. think this one worked pretty well. It's a really good venue. I mean, I don't have a point of comparison because I wasn't at the Vegas one last year. Mm. Well, neither was I, but as far as me being at a convention goes, there wasn't really anything inconvenient about it because um, the Moscow Center, where it was um, held, it was over three levels. So you had floor one, floor two, with all of the booths and stuff, and floor three with um, the main venue. Which main is stage. Where, yeah, the main stage, which is where you saw the, um, the keynote and the... Um, if you saw any of it, the Capcom Cup and uh, the the uh, special episode of PS I Love You, XOXO, that sort of thing. Yeah, so the way that it worked basically was the first floor was registration and the um, big ticket item, so Call of Duty. Believe it or not, Ratchet and Clank was a big ticket item. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know how they were giving out those... Um PlayStation Experience Collector's Cards. Which, if you're hearing a rumbling noise in the background, is in fact Kebabs opening up his box of collector cards right now. So, yeah, so the, by the, the way, numbers one through five are PlayStation. That is that is the designation. That's all they are. Yeah, they're, um, one through five is the Platinum, Gold, Silver, and Bronze Trophy Cards. Plus the... Um, number five is attending... PlayStation experience, but the main and the main way to get this is going to the keynote. The only way to get it is going to the keynote nope, for platinum. Bronze is platinum. if you bought something while you were there. Yeah, and everything after that is numbered. So, for example, Amplitude number twenty nine, Rigs Mechanized Combat League number eleven. Now, here's where things get interesting. Um, you would ex since um, what was it again? Um, six onwards is going to be the big tier titles. Um, Ratchet and Clank is number nine. Nine. So six, seven, and eight. Um, Uncharted is number seven. Number seven. So two below it. So and I think the one in between would have been Destiny or, Des Call, of, or yeah. Call of Duty, which we I weren't able to collect. Yeah, I think it's Destiny, given the heavy Sony association that the series already has. Sony is kind of building that with Call of Duty, but a. It hasn't even been a year yet, and B, there's so many other years where it was associated with Xbox. So, um, if you're noticing, the indie titles are getting much higher du double-digit numbers, and yeah. oddly enough, Ratchet and Clank this year, not that, not that it's an indie title, it certainly isn't, but it's not, it's not a Call of Duty. No, it doesn't have the... Um the sort of explosion that um, other titles have, despite the fact that it's full of them. <laughs> um, yeah, and on the show floor, when you're walking in, if you look straight down the middle, just to your right will be a big Ratchet and Clank banner, and underneath they had um, basically a fake red carpet um, with a popcorn machine and a big screen showing um, the official videos we've had so far, so... All of the trailers, both movie and game. Yeah, the only one that they didn't have was the original teaser on the white background, but that's understandable, it didn't really show anything that impressive. Yeah, so it was about four or five different trailers? Yeah, yeah. It was at least it was at least the two um, it was the two most main movie trailers, and yeah, I think the two, two game trailers, the two movie trailers. Yeah, it might have been one more game trailer. I I only saw part of it because it was looping around. Yeah. Um, and then behind that, they had um, a photo section where it looked like you were getting your photo taken at the Ratchet and Clank movie premiere. Yes. Sometimes with the official mascot, and then... Occasionally, people would drag me over. <laughs> yeah, for obvious reasons. Um, and behind those were all the game booths. And I have to say, the entire time I was there, I never saw more than one or two empty booths, and most of the time, there were multiple people waiting in line for each one. But at the same time, you, you very quickly got one because how many kiosks did they have? It was one kiosk where four, where four Ratchet and Clank booths, two back to back. Yeah. And they had at least three or four kiosks. So it I had to be 12 to 16. I think it was more five, maybe six. Okay, so we're talking about 20 yeah. um, Ratchet and Clank demos at any given point. And you had three options, as we mentioned, yeah, while we were have, actually um, at PSX. Yeah, you have... Um, Elero City, and what's interesting is that um, 
the naming has been switched. On a previous episode, we said that um, Metropolis is now the name of the planet. It isn't. It's been switched back to Kerwan, which means that Metropolis has now been retired. Completely. Because yeah. the, when I first heard it was a Lero city, and this was something I mentioned, um, I lived in Japan for a very long time. And in Japan, I lived in Tokyo. You're but always I, bringing this up. <laughs> not on the show. But no, to seriously. Tokyo is a metropolis. And within... Yes. And within the metropolis of Tokyo are a bunch of smaller cities. Now, Tokyo isn't the entirety of Japan. So Japan, then Tokyo, then I lived in Hachioji, which was the name of my city within a city. So when I heard Liro City, Metropolis, I assumed it was like Tokyo, where it was a district yeah. with a city name, because I was in Hachiojishi, the city of Hachioji. So the way you would um, define it then is Kirwan is the name of the planet, Metropolis is the name of the, the metropolis. The buildings on the planet. <laughs> and Lero City is the name of sort of like this broad section because Tokyo doesn't... Um, metro metropolis... Um, it doesn't cover the entire planet, although it looked like that in Ratchet and Clank 1. That's no longer the case. It is certainly a vast, vast city because we visited it three times in the previous games and we never saw the same bit twice. No, it's a very large city and even and the draw distance in the PS4 is fantastic. You can look out on the horizon and see very far out. Yeah, um, the, the main change really is that I don't think the actual building count has been upped that much from um, Tools of Destruction. Um, but the distances between them has been greatly enhanced because in Tools of Destruction, the, build the buildings were all relatively the same height. Mm. Um, it's just to um, basically for draw distance and you know how many objects are on screen purposes. But now you can be on top of a building, look out, and see many different buildings that are much lower than yours, and then see many more further away that are much higher. So you have vast spaces probably yeah. to make it so that you can fly your ships through it very well yeah because i wonder if the ship flying sections is going to be over and around say like the train area that we explored mm -hmm. so for those of you who are in the united states or in other countries where the demo has been available up until this point you're probably um if you've played the Aliro city demo it's identical to that i've played the same one in gamestop same with same with um the snaggle beast fight which yeah, is it's basically those two levels are the same ones that we saw at e3 earlier this year but the pokey taro level as we mentioned when we were at psx and we'll we'll be discussing in a little more in detail now that we've had some time to digest yeah why don't, um, why, we've been talking about metropolis a lot why don't we stick with that yeah i'm just i'm just saying that was a full level we had a lot to explore yeah that was um pokey taro's um, um, public playable dim, yeah. um, debut. The only the only thing was is as as we got a chance to see again, um, there is a section of Pokitaro that you need the the thruster pack for. Yeah. That we we didn't have when we were exploring it, so that section was closed off to us. Yeah. What but, I also noticed, um, I, I I pointed this out um, in the gallery thing, which we have still yet to do. There is sort of like this red gate on Pokitaru. I swam up to it and I noticed that there was a teleporter inside. So I think that is a secret teleporter to the um, scenic sewers. So it might still be there. Yeah, entrance or exit. Um, and as we mentioned in PSX, it might be that the sewers are now a very similar level to Silox, where you need that. Yeah, to get through the waterworks. But as we mentioned, um, let's go back through Metropolis and yeah. By the way, for those of you who are really curious about our uh, some of our comments as we were playing it, um, we will be uploading two videos uh, to YouTube and um, some other sites that uh, we may be able to link to. Yeah, well, we'll upload it to YouTube and then embed it into other places. Exactly. Um, one of them is me playing through Pokitaru um, and failing miserably, but not because I'm bad at Ratchet and Clank, but... You're wearing welding gloves for crying out loud. You'll wonder how Ratchet does it. <laughs> um, and you didn't notice this because um, you were too busy playing, but at, at m multiple points, I pan around to show people taking photos. <laughs> so yes, I was in full Ratchet and Clank costume. I'm not talking during it, but I will be um, narrating what I was thinking while I was doing it 
in a pair of welding gloves and a 40 pound costume. Uh, meanwhile, um, I filmed Kebabs uh, doing Met uh, Metropolis, doing Alero City, and he talked through it. And we're going to leave that audio as is. Um, mm. Talking about all of the hidden areas, the two the two hidden locations. Um, yeah, the things that I noticed. Yeah, um, draw distance, some other cool stuff. We'll so, probably be uh, treading over that same ground um, here in this recording. But what the video will do is give you a visual depiction of it, so that you can see what I'm talking about. Yeah. So we're gonna go through. In case you don't trust me. <laughs> yeah, uh, we're gonna go through um, Kebab's experience. Um, with Metropolis, and then both of us are going to talk about Pokitaro because each of us actually did different things in the demo mm. for Pokitaro. There's the one I filmed where I did the main route and fought the um, the uh, telepathopus. Telepathopus. I can never remember what that's called. I keep on calling it a squid. It's clearly not a squid. It has eight tentacles, not not ten. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and Kebabs will be talking about some of the secret routes that that we discovered after. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, the first time you play it, you don't really want to stray from the main mission, but uh, especially when I did it and I got into a glitch where the where um, the Grimroth lookalike um, got into a loop where even during, even when we were right next to each other progressing through the level, we'd say, hey, come on back now, we have an ocean to save, and it drove me nuts. And there was actually another hilarious glitch where I sequence broke. I jumped into the water, swam around to the end of the first section before you get onto the skiff, defeated the enemies, and then Grimroth walked forwards. So I'm like, oh, hey, I didn't get the cutscene. I walk towards where the ship would be at the start, and the cutscene starts again, and Grimroth starts from the same location. Again, he walks onto the skiff, but then he doesn't turn it on. Instead, he walks to the back end of the skiff and just walks off through into the water and through the level. Never to be seen again, so I had to restart. I have a feeling that's a bug that's going to be fixed, but we actually figured out that, um, uh, sorry, Ratchet, if we killed him um, and and uh, got bumped back... Yeah, you have no O2 mask on Pokitaro. Uh, you, do, you don't have an O2 mask on Pokitaro during the demo. Yeah. Um, it's before you receive it, but again, we'll get to that in a minute. So let's let's talk about what Kebabs did while he was in Alero City, because... Um, Alira City has already been picked pretty clean by people since it was the very first demo and it's pretty much available everywhere. Yeah, um, although I tend to have um, um, a particular eye for even more details. So, for example, the f one of the first things I did was um, I highly suspected that the beginning of the um, Alira City demo was not actually the beginning of the level, that we had been exploring it for a fair amount of time, because there's a suspicious looking closed door behind you right when you start. So what I did was, um, after defeating the enemies, because the first time I tried this I got tore apart by robotic dogs. Uh, fur flying everywhere, sadly. Rat yeah, yeah, they actually uh, grab Ratchet and... Um, after grabbing him, you can actually see them shaking and sort of like, shaking. these are clumps of orange-yellow fur. It's quite scary. Yeah, so Ratchet got a bit of a shave, unfortunately. Yeah, not a literal in-game one, but yeah. No. And um, what I did was that I walked to the balcony as best I could and looked backwards, and I could actually see the route behind him. And what I saw was a staircase leading to a walkway that turned, if you're coming down the staircase right a bunch of crates, normal in-game crates that hadn't been broken, and they led into a building. And then on the other side of that building were a bunch of metal crates, similar to the ones in the train station, where the only way to get up them was to do high jumps. And then at the top of those crates you could get to a balcony, and the only way to get to it was to stretch jump, and then there was a circular alcove running up the wall, which had enough room for an elevator. Now. If you've played Ratchet and Clank 1 more than once, that will seem instantly familiar to you because that is exactly the same as, as Al's Robo Shack. Yeah, get in the Halipack and then you are being taught how to use it. Yeah, so it's very likely, um, and as we mentioned from our PSX section, that we're that that is being magically by the power of the computer stitched into this episode along with this. Um, we talked about how when when you meet Al, 
you he already recognizes you and asks you about Cora. Yeah. Is that his shop on Metropolis? Is he the one who outfits Clank with the helipack? I would believe so, um, given that um, it wouldn't surprise me if someone like, oh, Al could mention Cora because Cora would might be the one who suggests that you head on to Al's RoboShack to get Clank upgraded so that Ratchet is more capable in battle. That's a possibility. The other one might be that, given Clank's status, he gets damaged again. Mm. Yeah, maybe. But it seems, um, from what we saw of Veldon, um, that Ratchet is a lot more knowledgeable about robots than he is in the original Ratchet and Clank. Yeah, I mean... He gave Clank a very thorough diagnostic when he first finds him. Yeah, he does. Because um, he, uh, he fixes stuff for a living. You probably got that from the... Um, the ambient dialogue um, and the fact that Ratchet just lives in his own garage. Well, he, he lives he, in Gre li Grimroth's garage. Yeah, he lives at a garage. Um, and in Pokitaru, he mentions what he does um, with Grimroth back on um, Felden. Um, speaking of high jumps and stretch jumps, one of the um, interesting control improvements that adjustments that they did is that. Um, you don't have to press crouch and jump at the same time to do a high jump or a stretch jump. If you're moving and you press R1 on the, def on the default controls, then Ratchet automatically does a stretch jump. If you're standing still, he automatically does a high jump when you press R1, which is much more convenient, I think. And it means that if you need to travel great distances, you can just mash R1 and Ratchet will do a stretch jump as soon as he hits the ground again. So it makes traveling faster much more convenient. Yeah, and it's no longer, since you're only dealing with one button instead of two, it's a lot harder to screw up. Yeah, I remember screwing up endlessly when I was um, trying out um, high jumping and stretch jumping for, for the first time. But I don't think I ever really got the hang of it until the end of Going Commando which isn't very good game design. You don't introduce a gameplay mechanic on the understanding that the player gets it by the end of the sequel, mm. right? But, um, and I had that same problem in Into the Nexus when they changed the control scheme. Uh, interestingly enough, even with my welding gloves on, um, I had very little trouble uh, stretch jumping or long jumping as I needed to. Um, if I had failures, it was because I didn't time things right, not because I couldn't perform the action. Yeah, the fault was more on the player rather yeah. than um, the actual control scheme. So, for example, switching back to Pukitaro for a bit, um, it's structured exactly the same. When you first get to the last island, the third island in the Pukitaro level, you need to extend the bridge. But the button this time is on the other side, so what you have to do is stretch jump to... Um, the sort of this uh, midway beam and then stretch jump again to where the button is um, And that is much easier to do when you only have one button to press. Yeah uh, and I Did actually fall into the water and unlike in other versions of the game you're not immediately eaten by a fish Although and that is possible. It is possible to be eaten by a fish. The way that it works is very interesting. We'll get to that in Pokitaro. Yeah. Or do yeah. we want to jump to that now? Because there's not really that much else to talk about Metropolis. That well, then we'll finish that bit off. Yeah, let's finish it off. Um, we'll get to how you get eaten by a killer fish once again. <laughs> um, so in Metropolis, uh, the next bit um, is in the train section. And... Um, there are two secret areas in there, just like in the older games. And um, so when you get up the stairs, there's the one to your right. In the original game, there's a gold bolt there. Um, in the new one, you have this sort of initial area that you can jump into, but then you can stretch jump up another crate and get to a more expanded secret area that has a lot of crates for bolts. And in Pokitaru, I actually went to um, the location of the gold bolt sitting atop the island that um, some people spotted during the ship fighting sections. I actually made my way up there and it's very interesting how you get there because there's no swing shot or anything. You actually have to be cruising around the waters and swimming. Yeah. yeah, you have to find that island and there is no obvious ledge you can jump up to. The quickest way to get there is from the end of the second section but then it's not obvious that you can actually climb up there. You have to attack it from the back 
and even then the platform from the back isn't obvious you have to get to a second one and then it's only at the third jump that you realize oh crap this is intentional but then when we got there there was no gold bolt so they've removed the gold bolts from the demo yeah so whether or not there is one on top of there we don't know or in metropolis or in metropolis we don't know but there were a lot of crates on metropolis where that gold bolt used to be whereas the island didn't have any crates yeah so that would suggest that the reward for that secret is more the fact that you get a lot of bolts which you can then spend on a new weapon yeah. speaking of which there were no vendors um, in any of the levels, not even Pokitaro, and that was no. You play, as far as we can tell, the entirety of the main section of Ratchet on foot, and there wasn't a vendor in the opening section. And his Galactic Ranger ship was missing too. Yes. So in Pokitaro as well, when you start the the level, you can't access a ship. It's not even that there's there's a ship there, but you can't enter it. There just is no ship on the pad. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so those levels are self-contained. You can't move from one level to another in any way, shape, or form. And again, no vendor, which means what whatever weapons they give you at the start of the level is what you get, and the ammo is only what's available. So again, when I mentioned that I ran out of ammo on Pokitaro, it's very likely that there's an ammo vendor at some point along that route. Yeah, and one of the benefits of Pokitaro is that it is technically routed in the sense that the skiff will act as an elevator to the second and third areas. But um, despite that, if you want to refuel, if you want to take the time, you can jump off and then swim all the way back to the first island and, re and restock your ammo. Yeah, so I have a feeling that there's going to be an ammo vendor near where mm. your ship is parked, if not one near the second time you fight the... Uh, the um, Telepathopus. Telepathopus. I'm never going to remember that. Absolutely never. You probably will after playing Gaspar, because that's your main featured level. That is true. Um, so after the telepath, uh, just before the second Telepathopus fight, and you you uh, you actually meet Al uh, for the second time, as we've discovered. Yeah. Or more than that. It's entirely possible that there's a second um, vendor over there as well, because there are spaces where it looked like there could be one. Yeah. Um, whether or not there is actually one along that route at the end, we don't know. Yeah. But but you can jump off that platform even after you've started fighting the telepathopus, um, which in my case was purely accidental because controls with welding gloves yeah um i accidentally fell off the level and i was like oh no i'm gonna have to start all over but no i just landed in the water and i swam myself back and there are plenty of ledges you can climb up on from the water at any point and i got myself back to the fight finished it and beat the level yeah so it's no sort of oh you left the fight he's got 100 percent health again no he actually when i got back there his health was where i left it yeah which is pretty good. Yeah, so so if you're knocked off the level, say from a from a shockwave, or if there's just too many of those little puffer fish that are attacking you because the telepathopus um, spits them out from time to time, mm -hmm. you can jump into the water. Um, and unless you're in an area with a killer fish, it, there's no fish in the water that can hurt you. Mm. Um, and you can swim back and basically give it another try. Yeah. Um. Yeah, no, we keep switching back to uh, Pokitaro. There's not really that much left to say about Metropolis because it's very familiar to us at this point. Um, the weapon loadout was exactly the same as before. The Groovatron, Combustor, Warmonger, and Pixelizer. Um, the level had um, those bronze bolts still, and while I was playing, I still couldn't figure out whether they actually gave you any more than usual. Um, the Pokitaro level did have a couple of gold-colored normal bolts. Yeah, not the giant gold bolts, but it seems to me that there's bronze, silver, and gold of the small standard money bolts. Wouldn't it be funny if there were trophies attached to that? So, for example, you get a bronze trophy for collecting a thousand bronze bolts, a silver trophy for collecting ten thousand silver bolts, and a gold trophy for collecting a hundred thousand gold bolts. I'd say it would be in the reverse, because the bronze bolts are the most common. Yeah. You'd need more of them. But you get the idea. Yeah. An appropriately colored trophy. I have an odd feeling that that's, say, a gold bolt is, a gold small bolt might be worth some multiplier of the base bronze ones. Yeah, I think so as well. There will just be some abject value increase. And 
that way there's a more visible way for the player to tell that they are actually earning more money because all of a sudden you're picking up um, silver bolts and then you're picking up gold bolts and then at a certain point you'll stop picking up bronze bolts and it's just gold and silver and then you'll notice that you don't really have that many much silver left when you're at the final level yeah um you know the disco party one i'll fix up we don't we don't again we're speculating right now but that's my opinion is that they're worth more not that they're a bolt applier like a new game plus sort of thing but just a visual representation that okay so you, this this enemy and this enemy drop the same number of items but one is worth more than the other yeah exactly um and which is different from how it worked in the past where the value of a bolt was determined by its shape rather than um what color it was so for example in ratchet one a basic um bolt a little bolt was one bolt a nut was worth five and then in going commander they introduced the spring which was 500 and then it's sort of a bolt with a rounded top that was worth a thousand i think and then there was this uh strange looking diode one which was worth i think uh, five thousand so this would be interesting because then any type of bolt if it's of a color is instantly worth say one bolt yeah it makes it i think it's a lot more visually distinct with the colors than it is with the shapes yeah it's more interesting and what that means is that um you won't come into the issue into an issue where say you have a silver bolt on an ice planet and you don't even know it's there mm. you'll have bolts of multiple colors lying around and chances are you're going to pick up one of them yeah so i think that's everything for a lero yeah um, pretty just, much anything else yeah the only thing i can really think of is that i think i actually spotted the um what's called the loop point with the train tracks because what happens with uh, the metropolis um train section is that um it obviously starts off in the train station and then heads off but then it goes into a loop which is how uncharted 2 did its train sections um it also had distinct environments of the jungle then the lake then the tunnel then the mountain but all those different sections are loops that use clever tricks such as nate crashing into a cabin that is completely enclosed to cover up the fact that it's switching the environments yeah i think that is the second area where you're um where you're using the handrails to shimmy across because you're in the tunnel no that's not true because um if you play it at a different speed or you stop around to wait for a bit like you know an insomniac having an interview and stopping to answer a question then um you will actually end up at a different point so for example while you were playing um the guy there was um a girl playing with her friends to our right and you know you know that final ending cutscene where the bomb blows up she had a blow up in that tunnel Oh, and it actually blew up in the tunnel? Yeah, it didn't damage the tunnel in any way, but that's where it happens to blow up. Huh, I've never seen that happen. Yeah. It's good to know that that's possible and that the, the game reacts to that. Yeah, there was another interesting one that I saw of a video where one website, um, there's a split in the track and normally the train goes around the curve. This one happened to be timed such that Ratchet's carriage went around the curve, but the one with the bomb kept going? <laughs> Yeah, it went off to the side of the screen oh, yeah, before because blowing up. It, 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 the, you separate the rest of the train off your track, and if you separate it exactly at that fork... Yeah, then you go one way and the bomb goes another. So the fact that they've, they've managed to uh, work that in, I'm, I'm pretty impressed. Yeah, so at a certain point, the, um, the track will loop back, and there was a certain point of the track where it's a straight and you're coming from a curve and they merge and I think that is where the train the train station start gets onto the loop yeah yeah which means that the train will never reach the hall of heroes it's, it's like the blog at the front line damn it you got it onto the loop how are we gonna get it off now <laughs>
but once once you've once you've removed the uh, the rest of the train, then it then it then it gets off of that loop and into the no. Hospital. The train stays on the loop, and the bomb goes off of a split that goes yeah. into the background. I guess. Yeah, but I mean, you're 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 on the not the caboose. You're on the engine, and that keeps going. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what that was. That's funny. it. The other thing, again, I'm probably going to mention this in the gallery, but um. Given the time of uh, day for the Metropolis section and just the normal logistics of the story, I'd say that the Metropolis portion in the movie takes place in the morning, and then the main and then the games portion takes place in the afternoon afterwards after Ratchet has joined the Rangers. Yeah, he doesn't have his costume yet, though. No, because he just... hasn't. Because he gets it on the space station from on that Galactic Ranger facility. Remember? Right. They they do. They they basically phase it in around him. Yeah, exactly. It's, when it might be hol- Yeah. When he is officially inducted. <laughs> um, we were arguing. What was it? Two lunar observers ago, whether or not that was holographic armor, or if it was physical armor that was just phasing in. Yeah, if it is um, holographic armor, then it. It's very telling that Ratchet would prefer to have the Ranger armor because he's such a big fan. <laughs> yeah, but it would also explain how easily it was on him because he's so tiny. Yeah. <laughs> also, um, just while we're on this subject, um, speaking of the Rangers, very interesting that Ratchet lied about that to Clank in the movie section. Right, he did. Um, well, it wasn't the movie section. It was the game section of Velden. Which had clips which from, from the, the movie. movie. Yeah. Um, so that was one of the movie clips. It was one of the cutscenes. So that's probably going to be in both. Yeah. So that's going to be a very inter. Well, assuming that they've written the story to accommodate for this, um, it's going to be interesting when Clank actually finds out that Ratchet is not a ranger. Um, I guess I would be disappointed if that wasn't a plot point, though. Yeah, I think that might take the place of. Um, as everybody who's played the first Ratchet and Clank know, Ratchet in the first game is a jerk. Yeah. A major jerk. And that's that's really... Only after um, Quark betrays him and he starts looking out for himself and basically he only keeps Clank around because he needs him to start the ship. Yeah. But even in, before that, he's very self-centered, mostly yeah. because he's an, he is an orphan. You don't see Yeah, he just, he just wants to travel around the galaxy, blow stuff up and have a good time. He's not really thinking of the mission and he's sort of it's incidental he, he, that he happens to be doing stuff. Yeah, like he makes an excuse to visit BTS. Like it's like, oh no, we're, we're not going there to pick up cool weapons. What Brine are boots? Yeah. What What are those? Yeah, like one of the scientists could know where Drake is and we'll just pick up these awesome grind boots on, while, we're, while we're there. Yeah, come on. Um, and then and then he's a huge jerk, but the, the, final, the final sort of climactic thing as far as Ratchet and Clank is concerned as opposed to the story is that Ratchet eventually comes around and that happens on Altanus, my least favorite level because it was so darn hard. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's an awesome design. It's just that ice. Yeah. That ice. <laughs> yeah. I'll leave it at that. But, um, but, but the long and short of it is, is that Ratchet up until this point has been very much a goody goody as far as we've seen him for the movie. Yeah, he's very much the character that he was in Awful One, Full Frontal Assault, and Into the Nexus. Where he's but very, he earned that. I know, but even a good story always has a character facing a challenge, handling it in a flawed way, and then overcoming that challenge yeah. in a good way. Unless it's, you know, not that kind of movie, but Ratchet's generally that kind of story. Um, but up until that um, point where he, where we saw him lie to Clank, Ratchet had very much been the heroic, well-rounded character that he was at the um, in the later games. Yeah, after which, he'd already learned his lessons. Yeah, exactly. It's just like they copy and pasted Ratchet and then just removed all of the games, but kept his behavior. But as we're seeing now, with the very least that he's covering up to to basically get what he wants. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that Clank trusts him, basically. Yeah, there, there's more to it than that, and we're probably going to see um, that that one little white lie, even though he does eventually become a ranger, um, maybe it'll undo him. Maybe. Yeah, he'll probably feel really guilty about it later, I think. Yeah. Um, the other um, interesting movie thing was... Um, 
at the beginning where um for one he's the set that scene starts on this garage with ratchet looking very very sad and disappointed and to me that is very it is very clear that that scene takes place after captain cork tells him you don't have what it takes um door slam <laughs> yeah and then ratchet heads out on his um rocket sled which he has built himself mm. with a clank seat but never mind um, well, I did explain. It's probably a jump seat. Yeah. Well, you will explain, uh, if the case I, may be. I was going to say, I think I mentioned this in a previous episode, but maybe I didn't. No, you uh, didn't. We did a previous recording of the gallery, but given that this will probably have new screenshots, we're going to start from the top, so that's probably what you're, what you're thinking of. Yes, we did record this for the the gallery, but... Um, yeah, we're going to start from the top, we're, just so we're that gonna, we have it all in one go. Exactly. But basically, um, Kebabs had said, why is there a second seat on, on, on his rocket sled? I'm like... Yeah, to because at the time, I said that didn't make sense, because in the original, it, it would make sense that he puts a smaller seat, because that's where Clank is going to go. The bar that goes over it is even just the right height for Clank to brace himself. But... I've ridden motorcycles, and that, that, that second seat on a motorcycle is usually higher than the first seat, one, so that the person behind you can also see, but two, if you notice, there's, always, there's also a footwell, mm. and I pointed this yeah. out to Kebabs, me being the blind person pointing out a footwell on a motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> I've ridden a lot of motorcycles, never and always as a passenger, sitting in that jump seat. There, there, you, I've seen some motorcycles where they're flush, but they're usually the second seat is higher mm. um, as, as it is on his rocket sled. But if you look closely, you'll see that that rocket sled has a, has a footwell for who si whoever's sitting second. So either Ratchet made it in mind with just that he's going to have a general passenger behind him, like Grimroth, even though Grimroth is huge. Yeah. Um, it's compatible for someone else. And yeah. You know, Ratchet is not the smallest race in the galaxy, so it could be that, um, given how well it's made, it could be that he built it from a schematics, kit. or yeah. it's just a vehicle that he bought, even. Yeah. He doesn't need to have made it, although evidence suggests that he has made it, but we'll get into, into that in the gallery. Yeah. So the long and short of it is, I think it's either a kit or that he made it to just accommodate a second person, like yeah. that Croyd lookalike that we've seen. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't look like it was made specifically for Clank. It's just there's because the footwell is just way too low. Yeah. Um, anyway, that particular scene um, when Ratchet gets to the crash site and gets Clank out, it felt very hastily edited, um, and it lacked certain shots that we have seen before. It lacked the moment where Ratchet uses the swing shot to swing to the other side of. Um, the canyon slash crater where Clank happened to crash in and sort of, um, you know that shot where he sort of swings around with the wrench on his back, he lands and then he turns around looking back down to the crash site, that was missing. So that scene has been edited down for briskness due to the fact that it's in the game. Yeah, so... I thought that was interesting that they did that. So what you saw at the keynote is not the full scene. No, it's not. Um, on that note, I'd like to make one correction um, about something that people saw in the keynote in the Velden area that is yeah. not going to be in the final game, according yeah. to Insomniacs it, on the forums. Yeah, and yeah, this has been mentioned, so this is probably information that you know already. But for those who don't know... Um, there is a line, if you watch the keynote, uh, where... As, was, Ratchet, as Ratchet is heading back as to his Ratchet garage. As Ratchet is heading back to his garage and Blarger attacking because they want to take Clank back because he's a defect. Yeah. Um, was it Ratchet or was it Grimroth who mentioned... No, it's Quark narrating. Oh, it's Quark, Quark narrating, you're correct, um, that the Blarg had a hand in destroying the Lombax race. Mm. Um, several members of the Insomniac team on the forums have come to pipe in and say that line had long been removed from the final product, so to disregard it. So if you were watching the keynote and heard that, and you're like, whoa, whoa, the Blarg and the Kragmites working together? Or the Blarg on and, their own, and the Kragmites are not involved with that. Well, it said that it, they had a hand, not that they did it. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, that I do remember. I remember what was said, just not who said it. Yeah, um, I mean, obviously it was Nefarious who helped them. Yeah, 
<laughs> but <laughs> but they said that that's been removed from the final game, so don't take that as canon. On the other hand, Ratchet does yell, son of a zoni. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, we know that um, the Galactic community is much more integrated this time. In the games, um, it felt almost like Ratchet was the first visitor of Solana in the Bogon and Polaris galaxies. But this time they feel much more integrated. We know that Megacorp and Gramonet are known and possibly established within Solana. And um, Grimroth's cousin on Pokitaru mentions that he and Grimroth actually moved to Solana from Polaris. Yes. So they're not a Solana race either. They're Yeah. And in Polaris, Zoni was always sort of um, a you know, God, oh, Jesus, um, yeah. stand in. So, um, you know, sweet eye of a Zoni. Was stuff like probably that. picked up by Ratchet from his mentor slash father. Grimoth. Or it's um, more... Even more generic than that. Yeah, as in, like, the Zoni are known through Solana and possibly Bogon, if that exists in the movie. We don't know about whatever. Yeah. Um, so it's one of two things. Either... Basically, Grimroth brought his pseudo religion to to to. Well, his his figures of speech, basically. Yeah. He doesn't need to believe Leave in, in the Zoni. Zoni. It's just, I mean, you know, you can totally not be religious. That oh, Jesus, for God's sake. Yeah, but the the long and short of it is, he brought it. Either he he specifically brought it, and Ratchet picked it up. Yeah. Or it's it, it's a more widespread belief, and most people use it as such. Yeah. We'll find out. We may yeah, not even it, find out. It has interesting implications. It I mean, does. this obviously doesn't affect anything, anything in the game but or the gameplay building. or the direct story. But yeah, as you just said, it is world building and it is different from the existing games, which is our most direct comparison, considering that this is, you know, half a new game, half a remake, half. And to get confusing <laughs> math, half an adaptation of a movie. <laughs> what are you, Quark with your math? Yeah. That's 115 percent. <laughs> um, You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> um, so are we done with uh, uh, basically with Velden and? Um, oh yeah. Oh no, no. We mentioned this in 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 PSX. So also, yeah, yeah, on the uh, in the cafeteria area yeah. where we were. Um, above the um, the PlayStation Live stage, actually, we were directly one floor above them. So if you've seen, um, say, the interview that Ted Price has on PlayStation Live, um, we were sitting above the stage where he got interviewed earlier that day. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I think it's time to move on to the rest of what we know about Pokitaru. Yep. So on to Pokitaru proper now. Mind if I talk first and then yeah, you sure. talk about Go that ahead. side route? Yep. All right. So Kebabs is going to cover the side route that he did because... Um, a, he has eyes, and, and I'd already run through the main route, but B, um, because I was doing it in welding gloves and a 40 to 60 pound costume, I need to actually weigh it one of these days, uh, I just wanted to see if I could actually clear out the Poke Tower rain, main route, um, just in general, because as I mentioned when I was at PSX and doing it the first day in costume, I ran out of ammo. Mm. And that was just, I discovered playing it the second time, even though I'd seen it played, I'd actually played it out of costume once, um, and I'd played it in costume once already. I did not, I just was really, really inefficient in my ammo use. Yeah. That was entirely my fault. Now, is yeah, it possible to run out of ammo? Yeah. Is and it there's one spot where it is very easy to do so because of um, lack of uh, gameplay telegraphing what it wants you to do and yeah. you can explain that so there's this one area where there's three blarg shooting at you and at, then there's at um the oh, second bridge it is um it is on the third island how you activate the bridge and you take a right and go up the stairs and normally before there were a bunch of puffer fish slash puffoids there now there are blarg yeah that so, area so there are three blarg and then there are puffer fish and they're both Scrapping at it. Yeah, and there, and the puffer fish turn to you. The blarg, of course, also turn to you, and you start mowing them down. Here's the problem. 
The puffer fish will continue to respawn until the three blarg are taken out. When I played it the first couple of times, I didn't realize this, and I wasted a very large quantity of ammo trying to take out these small swarms of puffer fish when I really should have been directing my my efforts at the three blarg. Yeah, and, and three three really just simple. Um, pixelator shots, and they were down. Yeah, exactly. And these weren't even like a big blark that you should... Um, they're not like the commanders on Metropolis where they demand your attention. These are just... Basic blark troopers. Yeah, they're mooks, basically. Yeah. So, you know, on the one hand, they're a step up from the puffoids, so it is likely that you'll shoot them. But the fact that you are an experienced ratchet player and you didn't realize this says to me that I think that this is a bit of a problem in terms of gameplay, and... The original game didn't have that particular facet to it where no. there were infinitely spawning puffoids and you had to take care of something. It worked fine beforehand, so I personally think that shouldn't be in the game. I don't mind that the blarg are there, that's cool, but I think the puffoids spawn unto take care of something that isn't really related to them aspect should, should um, be removed personally. Um, there's a couple ways to solve that problem. One is dialogue. Um, have the blarg start turning on you and moving closer to you would be another way. Yeah, you, like it they... It needs better telegraphing that the puffoids will continue to respawn on you until you take out the blarg. Yeah, because when you arrive, if you don't attack them, the blarg actually ignore you. They're so shooting the puffoids. If they are shooting directly at you, it is more likely for you to draw the, your, for them to draw your attention to them and then kill them. Yeah. But because the puffoids kept respawning, and I didn't see because no, I, you, you don't notice because there's yeah. a huge amount of them when you arrive and yeah. you shoot a couple, turn around, and you don't realize that five more have shown up. Yeah, no, they, 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 they. I mean, none of them are strong. They're puffoids. They're just little, the little round guys who can bite you. Yeah. But there's just so many of them, and there's only three blarg, and one of them is around a corner. Now you can see his shots, so you know that he's there. Mm. Um, you see all three of them blasting at these puffoids. Yeah. But the fact that there's no telegraphing, I will say this. It was very, very loud on the show floor, and it was almost impossible to hear anything coming out of the televisions. Yeah. We are playing the soundless, and this is a huge disadvantage to me. It's part of the course of conferences, of course. It is. So this isn't, this isn't any fault of them. Like, if they mixed it and made it too loud, that would have been impossible for people to talk. Yeah. To be fair, um, if the blog or anybody else did say something... It would have shown up on the subtitles, and I didn't see any subtitles. Okay, for you didn't see any subtitles. Okay, so yeah. then, then never mind. Forget that. Um, like even enemies shouting at you during gameplay get subtitles. Okay, see, I, I, I was focusing on the action, and I wasn't yeah. noticing that there were subtitles underneath, and you couldn't hear what was being said. It was entirely subtitles. So when there was a cutscene, I was reading them, but um, during gameplay, I was not paying attention, and with the noise of the convention floor. I couldn't hear anything. Mm. Um, so having them telegraph, oh, look, it's the defect, or, oh, there, the, there, there's a Lombax, or, oh, there, at this point, I believe he is a ranger, so, oh, no, it's one of the rangers. Yeah. And or, making some kind of conceited effort to let you know that there was, that you need to take those three guys out and not waste your ammo on the puffoids would go a long way. Yeah, I mean, it could be a line as simple as, it's the ranger in the defect. Get him! Yeah. Anything like that would, would make a lot more sense. Or, e without even saying anything, having the three of them move towards you, which they didn't. They're continuing to stay in their locations. You have to basically go to them. Yeah. They'll start shooting at you instead of the puffoids if you gather their attention, mm -hmm. but they don't move from their spots. Yeah. If they start drawing towards you, then you know you've got to move, get them out of the way first before the puffoids. Mm -hmm. The puffoids, by the way, don't just poof when you take care of the three blarg. You still need to kill any of them that are left on the field, but no new ones respawn. Yeah. So that was why my ammo got e e eaten up. Now, yeah. in the final version of the game, one of several things is going to happen. One, we had no we had no ammo vendors in the game. So yeah, we explained this earlier. Yeah, we explained this earlier. So when I ran out of ammo, I was screwed. And yeah, I mean, you could have scrounged the islands for more, but that's not a guarantee. A vendor is a guarantee. Yeah, and eventually, if you really are that bad, eventually you'd run out of ammo there too. Yeah, um, but and you the, can't use the Groovitron or the... Um, Comet Strike. 
or the um, photon drum, was it called? But you'd still be using the photon uh, drum in that boss fight for a different reason. Yeah, but it can't actually hit the telepathopus boss because no. it's too far and it doesn't activate when it hits an enemy. It activates when it hits the ground. And yeah. it's, you know, you're fighting from an elevated position, it's flying away from the ground. Yeah. It, it just doesn't work. It's the same problem as trying to fire a Groovatron at the nefarious fight in the end of Crack in Time. It it doesn't work. Yeah, because he's floating. Yeah. But, um, I mean, the the pro uh, the photon drum is good in that fight, but not for the telepathopus directly. Um, yeah, in a, on occasions, he'll spew out more puffoids. Yeah. And then the drum is a great way to take care of the floor guys. He doesn't spew them out, actually. He leaves, and then puffoids show up. He oh, right. Probably it's either a huge coincidence or he summoned them. But either yeah. way, he leaves and you've got to deal with something else that isn't the boss. Yeah, and that happens in stages when you're dealing with that boss. So um, when that happens, yeah, the drum's great, but the boss itself can't be hurt by the Well, nothing can be hurt by the Groovatron unless it upgrades like it does in uh, Kraken Time. Yeah. Um, but as we said, we had fixed levels on our weapons. Yep. So between the fixed levels and the lack of the vendor, mm -hmm. It was actually a lot harder than it should have been. Yeah, there are a couple of weapons that did really well against the Telepathopus. Um, the first was actually the Pixelizer. Pixelizer. It took out huge chunks of his health. And the other was the Buzz Blades. And they were effective for the same reason that the Chopper is a really effective weapon against Chain Blade or the B2 Brawler back in uh, Going Commando, which is the fact that when they hit an enemy, or in fact, if they hit any object, then they will... Um, start arcing around and aim for enemies. So if you hit a boss, then the same blade will arc around and hit him four more times. Yes. So you just keep firing those and you just see his health drop like a rock. Yeah. So by the way, the uh, buzz blades in, in um, Remastered act a lot more like the chopper, at least at level two, than they do like buzz blades from later games. Yeah, they're much um, more slow moving and they deal more damage. Yeah, the closest comparison is um, a Kraken Times buzz blades, I'd say. Yeah. Um, in FFA, they didn't really do that. Um, in FFA and Tools of Destruction, they behaved much more like the disc blade launcher, where they hit an enemy, they traveled through, but they didn't arc, they only traveled in straight lines. So for the, the only way they could hit an, hit an enemy again, or a different one, is that they rebounded off something first, which isn't usually that convenient because most Ratchet and Clank battlegrounds are actually quite open. Yeah, only in some of the arenas are they closed, and even then they could get embedded in the side of the arena in some cases. So the, it really does act like the Chopper or the Crack in Time. Buzz blades where yeah. they do arc, yeah. but I think they're closer to the chopper because they're a lot slower and they deal more damage. Yeah, um, here's the best way to put it: they arc around like a Kraken Times buzz blades, but the fire rate is FFA's. Yeah, but to compensate more damage. Yeah, they do well on big enemies. Over time, yeah. they will do effectively more damage. Um, and it's the same thing with the pixelizer, like the shot, like any of the shotguns. Each individual sort of pixel shot um, yeah. doesn't deal that much damage but a big boss like that's gonna take every single shot that it receives yeah so it's gonna it's gonna it's, hit a pretty big chunk of its health yeah because you'll notice when you fire it um, the edge of the firing cone has these five little beams and I have a suspicion that those beams individually deal damage in addition to the main c pixel cone in the center and a boss is also going to be hit by all six of those. Yeah. So the Pixelizer is a decent weapon. It's actually less effective on smaller but stronger enemies, as mm -hmm. I noticed. It took two or three hits to take down some of the um, mid-sized enemies in that Yeah, level. because they're smaller and thus they're not getting hit by every one of the Pixelizer's beams. No, so things like the, 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 the bombs were much more effective on those guys. Yeah. Uh, the Pixelizer is best either for a lot of very small enemies. Yeah, it is really, really good. good for clearing out a lot of very small enemies or hitting a boss. Yeah. It's not so good on the uh, small but tough enemies. That's when you need mm. to pull out the the BFG. Yeah, the Pixelizer, um, I will say, this does have a guaranteed knockback effect. So while it doesn't deal damage as quickly to enemies as, say, the Warmonger, um, it does keep them occupied. So if you don't mind wasting a bit more ammo, it's still pretty good. Yeah. So uh, Pixelizer 10 out of 10 would, would blow the, the brains out of a uh, 
telepathopus again. Yeah. Um, now, we discovered a few very cool things in the Pokitaru level. Um, there were three. Um, can, I, can I start with, first off, that, that ability to swim? Um, so if you fall off a platform in Pokitaru anywhere, you are not immediately dead. Yeah, you're not penalized. It is yeah. open world swimming, basically. And there is a ladder to get you back up. Although I will say this, it was very hard to see because it is dark red. I think the actual ladder rungs should be colored yellow so that they're easier to see. I, which is odd because I had absolutely no problem finding them. I got lost. You got lost. Um, but also, I don't think the mini map was up. No, actually, damn it, we didn't do that. We didn't try to bring up the map. I don't think you could. I tried all of the buttons. Oh, yeah, when I you're first right. Started. Yeah, I do yeah. recall pressing L3 and you couldn't bring up the map. No, you couldn't bring up the map, so that's part of it. That's just the demo. So <gasps> it doesn't have a map! You scared me for a second. <laughs> no. The game doesn't have a map, you guys! <laughs> Kebabs is spreading misinformation again. And crying. Do I need to throw Caden at your face? I am going to do it. Caden is sitting right there. Uh, anyway, sorry, what were you going to say? <laughs> so, yeah, so um, that was just a function of the fact that we're playing the demo, which doesn't include a map. Yeah, um, it makes sense for them not to include that, because it'll just be distracting. Yeah, especially considering their whole area, except for Pokitaru, the other two areas are just areas, very small sections to give you a taste of what things are like. Yeah. Um, Pokitaru, you basically... It's much more open, yeah. You basically had the whole level other than the flying section, yeah. And the sewer, what we, we are assuming, but may not be the sewer section, because you don't have the jet pack yet, the thruster yeah. pack. Well, yeah, it's interesting. You, yeah, well, it makes sense that it's the exit. It looks more like an exit rather than a secret entrance. Um, yeah, I think that's how you get out and back into the main level. Yeah, the only, there are only two instances where I can think of a secret third route in a level. Um, the first is Navalis, if you head behind the ship, that is sort of... Um, it's not secret, but it's easy to miss. Yeah. And the other is um, the second route for um, the Thran asteroid belt. Now, Pure Arsenal so also behind the ship and behind some ice walls. Easy yeah. to miss that as well. Because the camera is facing away from it. And you're thinking, okay, that's the level. No reason to look back. Up your arsenal doesn't have sidebars, right? Hmm. Yeah. The up, I was going to say, up your arsenal for the most part was pretty linear, but there were a few. Yeah. Um, but getting back to this, yeah. uh, so so really the, the only two areas that were closed off to you in Pokitaro, and Pokitaro is huge. Yeah, it is pretty big, especially considering that the Hydro Pack, it, it, um, the Hydro Pack functionality has also changed. Similar to the straight jump and the high jump, Ratchet automatically uses it when swimming once you get it. What do you mean Ratchet? Clank automatically uses it when swimming once you get it. Okay, sure, but you don't <laughs> need to press um, anything for the Hydro Pack to be used. No, you, you automatically it. swim fast. Yeah, which is good because that whole, well, that was more Ratchet 1. Um, Quest of Booty and uh, Tools of Destruction had Ratchet swim at a um, consistent pace because he was kicking with his legs rather than doing a sort of a breast stroke. Yeah. So. But anyway, it's uh, it's much faster. Yeah. So you you don't even have an option. You will when you when you go underwater, you immediately um, use the hydro pack. Number two was. He didn't have the O2 max yet, so no. drowning exists. Yeah, exactly. Which is yes. something we haven't had since Ratchet and Clank 1. Yeah, if you've seen previous videos where it has the hexagon um, for the jetpack with the meter running around the edges of the hexagon, it's basically that. Except yeah. in the middle, it's got the icon of Ratchet's ranger helmet, which he didn't have because, well, I don't know. Well, he had his base helmet. Yeah, that's actually... He had the actually, little skull cap thing. That but. is actually very strange. It's, 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 it's now introduced a continuity error, I just realized, because in the movie clip, when he gets the ranger armor, his helmet phases in. But... But it's only the skull cap that phases in, not the whole glassed armor, does it? No, it's, it's the full armor. Oh, it's include, he it's, includes the helmet. So, and he's in his ranger armor in Pokitaru, so... If, assuming, you know, when he gets the helmet, it's very clearly a space helmet. It looks yeah. like the ones, you know, from Gravity, Interstellar, 
Prometheus, that sort of thing. Yeah, and so, it's fully sealed, unlike... Yeah, even, so even Into the Nexus had Ratchet's ears exposed to the depths of space. Yeah. This is a fully sealed helmet. Yeah, so um, when he swims underwater, sure, the helmet's not going to provide unlimited air, but it doesn't even turn on. Um, it may not. I mean, if it's a space helmet, would you want it rusting underwater? This is the future. It doesn't rust. <laughs> okay. And it's a program. Um, well, we don't know that yet. It could okay. be a physical helmet. It could be a physical thing that pops in. It has just... to be a physical thing, because what's the use of a holographic helmet? Well, <laughs> if it's, like, hard light armor. Yeah, yeah, I suppose. But, um... The, uh, yeah, he keeps his skull cap even when swimming. It doesn't pop out, which means that either his, ra his in the, in the, in the game, he doesn't get the, uh, he doesn't get a space mask right away. Yeah, it could be that, um, that specific armor thing is, uh, cut from the game, which means that they are, in fact, slightly different timelines. But yeah. then it's Quark telling the story, so it could be... Quark being that's Quark. The, that's the excuse. He simply forgot. Yeah. As per, as per usual. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, until you get an O2 mask of some kind, maybe it's maybe it is his all-purpose helmet, or maybe it is a specific swimming mask. Um, he does have a dive meter, mm. and you can go as deep as you want. You yeah. just have to surface before he runs out of oxygen. Yeah, there were loads of hidden crates underwater, and it was the same mechanic as it was in Ratchet and Clank 1. Metal crates and then TNT crates, which you had to touch. Actually, touching didn't even work. I had to full-on ram into them in order to set them off Yeah, the, the timer. The TNT crates in this game um, aren't as, in a, in a good way, aren't as sensitive as the Future Saga yeah, crates. at least underwater. Uh, no, I tried some on land when oh. I was playing around. I don't know if you noticed. I walked up to a few. You have to actually, like, butt them. You can't just, like, sort of look at them and they'll explode. You have to actually okay. full-on butt them and then the timer will start. I'm not sure about that change because it was interesting to me, at least. It made it a little bit more interesting and exciting in a very small way, at least, to, you know, you had to be wary around them. They demanded your attention. They still do. I mean, they'll still blow up, but but yes, just course. accidentally brushing one isn't going to set it off. Yeah, that's true. And in a way, if you're brushing up against them, there's no way you're going to be caught in the explosion. Yeah. Because, you know, it's a timer. It's still, it, I mean, even in the old days, it was still a timer. It was just, it's a little less, it's a little less sensitive in a good way. It's, yeah. I think that's, that's more of a player anti-frustration feature than anything else. Yeah. But anyway, I wouldn't be surprised if those crates were connected to a skill point. No, there's a lot of them underwater. Yeah, there is. Yes. Um, there is a lot. And speaking of a lot of crates underwater, what did you find when you blew up a certain set of them? Oh, I didn't even need to blow those up. They were covering half the entrance. Yeah. Um, I discovered the route to the, um, the gold bolt up the waterfall section that is, as I suspected, still in the game. Except that my personal opinion, and again, opinion... Um, there is no gold bolt there even in the final game. As we mentioned before, gold bolts as well as our uh, vendors were removed for the demos. Yeah. I don't think there's a gold bolt there anymore. And Yeah, because uh, uh, you find the telepathopus again at the end of that. Yes, so at the end of that route, even even in the demo, there's no gold bolt, but you fight the telepathopus. Um, but what did you get? Didn't you get a new um, mission? When yeah. you found, when you actually, yeah, when you when, actually surfaced? Yeah, um, specifically, um, I went through the tunnel, and just like last time, it is a bit of a stretch on your O2 mask. If you detonate the TNT crates, wait, well, if you touch the TNT crates, swim away, wait for them to blow up, go through when they're gone, and try to get to the surface, you won't actually make it. No, you have to, you've got to do the TNT crates, go up for air, and then come back to, around and do it. Yeah, exactly. And I surfaced, and I climbed up the, um, the cliffs. There's no actual metal structure there this time. It's replaced with um, rocks. Natural. And when, yeah. yeah, and when I got up to the top, I got a mission banner up the top that said, find a way up the waterfall. So I got a new mission. What that means to me is that gold bolts never typically had missions associated with them. Yeah. I think what's going to be at the end of that formerly gold bolt route, and we have a second 
reason why we think it might not be a gold bolt anymore, and it has to do with Mr. Not Grim Roth yeah. um, mentioning as you're doing the main route, the one that I the one that I did, mm -hmm. um, that he and Grim Roth used to actually go climb those waterfalls to look for gold bolts. Yeah, it's very likely in this version that Grimroth and his brother slash cousin, we, we're not sure what he is in relation to each other. No, he has a different name though. Yeah, he does. We, picked, is... we picked it up in the um, recording and um, I do point it out, I think, in your playthrough. Yes, you do. I can't remember off the top of my head. But, Me neither. But, yeah, but we'll, uh, But in the, the YouTube videos that we're gonna be putting up, you'll be able to, um, to see and hear his name. Uh, it's two words and I know the second of the two words starts with an R. Yeah. That I do remember. Yeah. Um, That's probably his last name, and Grimroth has the same last name because we don't know it. Yeah. So they could be brothers, they could be cousins. Um, we're not sure. Ratchet does comment on how alike they look. Yeah, like it is specifically called out, not even in a referenced way, but it is. Like, Ratchet basically says, what? Yeah, like <laughs> the, the resemblance is. Uncanny. I know, uncanny. Yeah. So it's very likely that they're not twins, yeah. because otherwise that would be, be less would, surprising. It would be treated a little bit more naturally. Yeah. So it's very likely that they're not twins, but they're at least at least cousins, if not brothers. Yeah. He's wearing the same shit as the resort owner, though. Yeah, the former resort owner from the first game. Yeah. Very loud Hawaiian shirt. But anyway, getting to the point is that because not Grimroth, um, mentions that he used to climb and get gold bolts there, and because you get a actual mission when you when you surface, um, it's very likely that you get a gadget or an item, an optional one, like say a bolt grabber. Yeah, or a box basher. Or a box basher. An or, improved one. Because yeah. We'll get to this after this. Yeah, um, like a level two, um, like you would get in Going Commando, um, because. Of those two things and the the boss the sort of mini boss fight you have to get before that you're yeah. probably getting some kind of optional gadget yeah a sort of a, a side one it's not a required one that you need to use the career section it's more it's a perk gadget yeah um and i don't think it would be raritanium that they just removed either because you find the telepathopus and the fact that you two are exchanging shots in the raritanium would be caught in the crossfire it would be it would it would be glowing and coming towards you before you even finish the fight. Yeah, and then you just you, you just bugger off. You don't want to fight that thing. No, that thing ta that thing has a lot of health, and it's it doesn't ha it only has one major attack, but it's annoying. Yeah, I also noticed that when you finish the telepathopus at the end of the main Pokitaru route, it doesn't die. Unless you're fighting multiple ones, it does explode. Each one does explode in a flurry of uh, green goo, does, yeah. don't they? Yeah, they do. So you could be finding several. And actually, when I was getting that gold bolt atop that island that I mentioned earlier, Ratchet does actually mention, say, come on, we have to get back before more telepathopuses show up. So he's fighting different ones. Yes, they're not all the same. It's it's just another one of them every single time. It's just probably a small colony on Pokitaru. Okay, that makes more sense. That does make more sense. The, it's not going away because it does really explode in a green goo when you fight each one. So you're just fighting a colony. Yeah, yeah. You, came, you bumped into a new one. Yeah. And I'm thinking that, as you say, like the going commando boss... It's not sort of waiting for you at the end and the boss shows up, because you could still just walk up to it and run away. Yeah. It will drop it once you kill it. Yeah. So, um, like, if any of you played Going Commando, once you get the um, Magna Boots, uh, well, sorry, they're not Magna Boots in Going Commando, they're uh, Gravity, gravity boots. boots. And we better hope they're Gravity Boots this time. Yeah. Um, you can actually go back to the first planet that you visit, Uzla. Yeah, the and first one that you can go back to. Go back to, because you can't go back to uh, the, that the, the same sky. That same section of It's yeah. confusing. Yeah, but anyway, um, you can go back to Uzla and fight an entirely optional boss, and when you beat the fight... Not when you're not when you're in the arena, but actually when when the thing dies, there's a cutscene and you get I can't remember if it's the box basher it's the, or uh, the bolt grabber. It's one of those two. It's the box basher because you get the armor magnetizer from Zergo. Right. Um, yeah, and or, or that's another thing that could be happening is that you get like 
And you, you, you don't get a thing to trade for. Tr trade for a, a box basher or a bolt grab or like the, the statue yeah. for Zergo. My theory is that the reason why I got that mission is that after you finish Pokitaru, not Grimroth will give you a side mission for you to do. Say, find that secret area that he mentioned because I left something there. Yeah. And then you go grab it for him, and then in return, he gives you something else. Or he just mentions that, oh, when I was a kid, I dropped something there. Yeah. And he doesn't care about it personally, but he's letting you know that if you find it, it's yours. Yeah. Um, but yeah, our, our consensus is that there's no gold bolt in that route anymore. Yeah. And so far, there hasn't been any evidence that there's some sort of extra unlockable, sorry, findable thing like... For example, in a crack in time, we had, in addition to gold bolts, Zoni and Constructo mods. Yes. There doesn't appear to be any evidence of those existing, because we would have seen them by now. They yeah. They have talked about. Now, we have seen images of some of the um, rangers using, using Constructo mod weapons. Yeah, again, we'll get to that in the gallery. Yeah, we'll get to that in the gallery separately, but it, there's no evidence that we, as Ratchet, will actually... Yeah, no other collectibles other than gold yeah. bolts. Yeah, as far as as we know. Yeah. Um, now, one of the other cool things is that um, in the area where the final Telepathopus boss fight was, I'd been exploring around some of the uh, different sort of resort home things, because um, similar to Igliac, they have balconies that you can walk around. Most of them don't have anything, but if you go to the one where Bob's RoboShack used to be in the original, you will find a chunk of Eritanium in the back, so, you know, Remember that for when you're playing the game. Yeah, and that's even though the regular raritanium isn't showing up in the in 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 the demos, that specific area has a chunk of raritanium. Yeah. So secret they forgot to get rid of it for the demo. Yeah. Uh, or just in general that 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 it's a physical location for raritanium that isn't there that may be the only one in the area other than say yeah. and it was slightly different than it was in tools of destruction and a crack in time because it's actually embedded in you pick up a raritanium crystal but it was embedded in more crude raritanium ore and i actually didn't think it was raritanium i thought it was just some sort of plant coral, you know, yeah coral object which makes sense because we're in pokitaru for crying out loud yeah so I smacked it with my wrench just to make sure, and hell, you know, breakables. You know, yeah. I get a couple of bolts. Nope, and raritanium. And I got raritanium instead. Um, other things to know, and I this is just a stupid thing that's funny. Um, on a lot of the little huts around them, there's deck chairs. Yeah, and the de <laughs> and unlike most breakables, the deck chairs actually you don't need to hit them with your wrench to get bolts and quote-unquote break them you just need to walk into them and they'll instantly start flying around yeah but the funnier thing is this um i don't know if this is just because it's the demo or if it's just how it is but if you send one of those chairs flying and sort of on its side rolling about it will always pop upright again yeah it'll always land upright it's like those you know wibbly wobbly things yeah, yeah those bobbing toys with the rounded bottoms that always right themselves and i've gotten like you know, a deck chair upside down, and then just like in a racing game where you go, where you land on the roof, it goes whoop, and lands on its legs again. Yeah. Um, now, only the four legged deck chairs do this. The long, loungy chairs don't. So when you hit a long, loungy chair, it just sort of sits where it lays. I don't think I managed to flip one of those. No, I, I did. Oh, I know, and I okay. noticed that. Uh, it's yeah. just the, the, the tall, standard four legged chairs. Yeah. Um, but the deck chairs act like normal gravity, which which means to me that um, the gravity's fine. It's just it's just a little hidden Easter egg as to how those chairs behave. Yeah, I mean, I can certainly see why they put that in for aesthetics, but in my opinion, it's funny to have them lay on their side. Yeah, so... Or at least it's more realistic and believable for them to be on their side rather than flipping upright instantly. Honestly, um, if it's a hurricane area, there might be weighted chairs, but I don't think anybody in Somniac was thinking about that. <laughs> what the actions that they do defy weight. Yeah. I mean, if it was on its side and it popped back up, that would be one thing. But these yeah, these chairs, like some of the chairs weights. flipped over from being on their, from being on their head, basically. Yeah. Um, so it's just, it was just a stupid little thing I noticed, but I thought it was hilarious. Yeah. I was giggling inside my suit. It was, I, I thought it was really funny. Yeah. Now the final 
awesome thing that we discovered in Pogitaro was... Fish! Uh, Oh, yeah, we should mention that as well. Oh, um, yeah. When you're swimming around, um, there are actually a bunch of uh, puffoids swimming around in the Pokitaro waters, but they won't actually attack you. Now, you might, um, in Ratchet and Clank 1, they kept you in that confined area, basically with invisible walls, and that was very jarring. What they've done this time is that around, circling around the Pokitaro area, are a bunch of those killer piranha fish that yeah. we, like in Blackwater Bay, uh, Blackwater City. Yeah, and there's actually a container of one in uh, the Metropolis level that tries yeah. to eat some puffer fish, but the hole's too small and it can't. But anyway, they're circling around the waters, and if you swim out to them, one will actually come up and eat you. It glitched out when I tried it, but the fact of the matter is, is that they visibly swim up and eat you. They don't come out of nowhere. One will swim out from where you can see it yeah so you have a visible water. representation and i don't know because i didn't i didn't go into the water um in most of the water they're you're fine like they're just not there but you yeah, can always exactly. see where the path is so you i mean you, you, are they true walls no because i think you might be able to swim back into the safe area if you're fast enough yeah i didn't try that but i think if i wouldn't be surprised if if they go after you they eat you every time just yeah. so that you don't try and get too tricksy with it because if you can swim back then it might be possible to cheat the system and then get past them yeah and swim too far out but their function is basically the same as the lurker fish and and the drones and the tentacles in the main three jack games where they're there to act as barriers so that you can normally swim in in certain areas freely but if you go too far in certain directions then they'll grab you so that you know you don't break the game yeah so really it's it's just a invisible wall that has a legit reason for being there and that legit reason is lots and lots of sharp teeth yeah exactly an invisible wall with teeth <laughs> but the final funny thing that i forgot to mention that i was going to mention it's not the fish it's um at the at the end of my pokitaru playthrough um I noticed that um, Grimrock, not Grimrock, wasn't moving. I'd forgotten an enemy. And I thought I'd try out something. I shot him with the pixelizer. Yes! And I he totally pixelized! Yeah, every NPC. And all, not only that, but when you stood in the doorway of, of the, yeah. the, the resort area where yeah. Alice standing, you tried it again. Yeah, I, sh um, I stood in the doorway into the resort, which is where the old uh, hangar was with the Blarg ship in Ratchet and Clank 1. This time it's a Tiki Lounge. And um, I stood in the doorway, but I didn't actually walk through it to trigger the cutscene. I fired inside and NPC Owl also pixelized. It was great. Actually, um, some of the Tharpods did as well. Yeah, the Tharpod patrons. We saw a sort of a teenage Tharpod in there as well. It looked like a grown-up version of one of Susie's friends from Over One. Yeah, but the short version is, is that, um, by the way, they do pop back after a few seconds. Yeah, they don't pixelize for as long as normal enemies. They yeah. pixelize for about two maybe three seconds. seconds yeah but long enough for you to get a good laugh yeah exactly and hopefully there is no everybody pixelized now skill point oh god but it's maybe probably but it's hilarious all the same yeah it works on npcs and it works on everybody yeah so, um, yeah, pixelize your friends, pixelize your enemies, pixelize your friends' enemies. Yeah, we should have pixelized that Mega Man statue, brought him back to normal. <laughs> there, was a, there was a Mega Man statue in the, Play State, in the PlayStation Network section of E3. He looked really cool. Yeah, I took a photo with him. Ratchet towered over him, which was hilarious because the official Ratchet towered over me. Hmm. Good head taller. Yeah, someone, but you someone are took his actually, vitamins. You are actually the um, height stated for Ratchet in, the, in his Jack X profile, so. Yes. You are cannon. I. Th th are you going to be shooting me out of a cannon? No. <laughs> All right. So, um, we got anything else to chat about, or we covered it? Yeah, I mean. The, the BTS level was um, also in the game. There were no Agents of Doom. Um, I think they were replaced with an, another weapon that we already knew about before. Yeah, no, the, um, if I remember correctly, what you had to work with with BTS was the uh, Pyrocitor, the Combustor, Mr. Zircon, Gravitron, uh, the Pixelizer, Predator Launcher, Predator Launcher Fusion Bomb. 
Am I missing anything? Oh, and the Devastator, I think? No, the, you didn't have a rocket launcher. No, you and did a not. Monger, but you didn't have it either way. No. Um, it was did a full, I say Gro I said Groovatron. Yeah, it was a full quick select slot. So it was one, eight. two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, eight. Yeah. So I think you mentioned all of them. Yeah, so that's what you had to work with. I mean, we know the Agents of Doom are in the game. We just, in any of the demos, you don't have them as to play with. Yeah, and... No one's been able to fire them. It's so funny that the one video that we found them in, where they highlight it, but they don't pick it. They don't, which means that it was probably not completed at the time. They just wanted to show you that it was an option. Yeah, maybe a PR person just quickly nudged his stick. Yeah. So that he didn't pick it and crash the game. <laughs> or they were like, yeah, don't you dare, because it's a surprise. Yeah, but the bloggy and Snaggle Beast fight was... is. The, it's the same as it is, and it's one arena. It's mainly to you, to show off the various weapons, weapons yeah. that you have available. Um, it's not gameplay related, and it wasn't really anything new. No. The only thing that I saw that was new was that when he does his big flamethrower attack, the beam is no longer perfectly straight. It actually wafts and wobbles a little bit. By and large, it is still straight and rigid. It doesn't bend like, you know, an actual fire flamethrower would as... I keep mentioning, mm. but it it does at least wobble. Yeah, it's it's oh. a little bit more. The beam is slightly fluid, like water. There is one thing I'd like to mention that you noticed that you picked up on that level, but it was true on any of the levels that you had the pyrocitor. So basically, Pokitaro as well mm -hmm. um, was that. Um, if you fire the Parasitor on somebody long enough, they actually burst into flame. Oh, really? Did you not notice that? They turn... They, no, I mean, I yeah. know, they get this sort of orange sh underglow, yeah. but they don't actually catch fire, I don't think. I mean, it's no extra damage, but it's very clearly showing you that it's you dealing hit, damage. Yeah. yeah. Which, um, which can be hard to tell, because ultimately you're looking at a 2D image. Yeah. So that's a nice little visual cue that you're actually hitting your target because that was one big problem I've always had with the Pyrocitor and why I very rarely use it unless I'm surrounded by swarms is that who are you hitting? 90% of the time it's very hard for me to tell and this this little visual tick of them being on fire and it's not like a blazing fire it's just they're sort of glowing Yeah. Um, really helps letting you know hey you're actually hitting your target here yeah speaking of enemies glowing I noticed that the predator launcher works very subtly different from how it did in tools and uh, Chris booty I don't like the new version of the predator launcher and this is coming from someone who always loved to use it it is a bit weak um, it's a little weaker but the bigger thing is is that it's not a it's not a gimme aim yeah basically what happens is that you hold the trigger and rockets do pop out, but they won't actually hit anything until you actually paint an enemy with your aiming reticule. So you can actually fire rockets and they'll hit at nothing because you didn't actually aim at a specific lock-on target. Yeah, so unlike every other Predator launcher we've seen to date, which automatically locks onto something if, you, if you're not aiming, it'll find something to hit. They're, they're heat-seeking. Yeah. This Predator Launcher is not heat-seeking. Yeah, you have to aim it. You have to actually aim the Predator. Now, the Predator Launcher's aim box is large. It, it, it's, it's quite large. It's like, quite large, but there's still it's still easy enough to miss things. It's it's a big circle it's not in the even center. A it's not even a guaranteed hit, because no. the Predator Rockets... It's the same as the switch from the Devastator to the Mini Rocket Tube, where instead of being slow but precise, they're now fast. But if the enemy is moving and you have enough distance, the Predator Rockets will miss. They will not track an enemy. They will go to where the enemy was when you fired them. Yeah. Well, let go of our one. Now, is it possible oh, that Raritanium oh, upgrades... R2-D2. Uh, possible that Raritanium upgrades will give it heat-seeking capabilities? That's a, good, that's a good point. That could be its main unique upgrade. Yeah. Is that they become heat-seeking with enough upgrades. I'm, I personally don't really like that, that you have to earn the heat-seek, mostly because the big, the big draw of using the Predator Launcher is that it's not a particularly strong weapon, but it's a guaranteed hit. Yeah, fire and forget. Yeah. It's, it's good for covering your butt. Um, yeah. And it loses that when you have to actually aim them. Yeah. Again, aim box is pretty large, so it's not terrible, but it's still, it's now a weaker weapon with without its its core functionality. Yeah. 
Um, and the damage output overall is smaller as well, which yeah. I think is a shame because one of the reasons why I liked it so much, it was certainly not a Rhino or a rocket launcher, but it still dealt enough damage that you considered using it a lot, it's a lot of the time. Yeah, and it always used to be very good against bosses because if the boss like moved around the arena... The boss had... Bosses being bigger would have multiple targets on them because the old Predator launcher, you could only lock two rockets onto a specific body Tar part yeah. of the boss. So that aspect has also changed. You can actually fire four rockets onto one target. Yeah, because again, you've got an well, aiming... Well, one small enemy, yeah. like one of those BTS toads. You've got, a, you've got an aiming reticule, and anything that's in that reticule will get hit. Yeah, it's like a big circle that... Um, it's about um, two-thirds the height of the screen. Yeah, I would say if you, if you made a, the screen into nine little rectangles... Like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, mm -hmm. uh, like top, middle, bottom. It hits five. Okay. Like like rectangle number five. Oh yeah. Like if you're playing Sudoku or something, and you you've got not the nine squares. Okay. It's, hit, it's hitting that fifth one. All right. Um, what was the other thing that I wanted to mention about the Predator launcher that hopefully I'll let it out? Oh yes, I remember. Um, okay, go ahead. Each additional rocket takes a little bit longer to load than the previous yes, ones. Yes, that was it. Um, yeah. Instead of having the old one was like ding, 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 ding. This one, this is, one is more like ding, 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 ding. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's uh, diminishing returns. Yeah, it takes longer. And it is actually possible you discover this technique that you just, um, you don't tap um, the fire button, but you hold it down for a moment and then let it go and the rocket will near as makes no difference fire instantly. Yeah, so um, I, I discovered this by accident, mostly because my hand slipped, um, but Predator Launcher in this version without any raritanium upgrades, and again, I think that some speed is probably going to be one of its upgrades. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. I would Get not rid be of the uh, Get... slower fourth one Yeah, and add more to there's going to be a load up. yeah. I was going to say there's going to be more more load per per max. That I was think one of one. the tools upgrades. Yeah, that was one of the tools as well as speed actually. So, yeah. um, I think that um, the predator launcher is eventually going to lose that as you upgrade it. Yeah. But to start, as we received the predator launcher, there's diminishing returns on on shooting them, so it's better to just shoot them out one at a time. Yeah. And I can say this about the combustor and the uh, buzz blades, where I don't think any of the weapons were actually upgraded through raritanium because both the buzz blades and the combustor fired really slowly as if you had just gotten them for the first time in full frontal assault. And so either I see that as either proof that the raritanium upgrades are there and haven't been upgraded, um, been applied, or that I need to hope the hell that insomnia changes the default fire rate if you can't change them. Yeah, so uh, my personal opinion is that those those are probably not raritanium upgraded in yeah. any way. Um, that, that's my suspicion as well. Yeah, um, but as as they are base, as uh, as they are the base weapons, uh, rare, the predator launcher is severely nerfed. Yeah, I agree. It is um, even the normal one without upgrading the, the damage um, was fairly respectable. Now, to be fair, while it was, um, I think, V3 or V4, we were on Pokitaru, which was in the mid section of the game. And if it's like in Tools of Destruction, you pick it up sort of in the beginning. Mm. So, um, Predator Launcher, 2 out of 10, blow shit up. Yeah, as it sure. stands, okay. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I'm I'm really crossing my fingers on on raritanium on that guy because I didn't I didn't really like how it handled. Yeah. Um, well, um, is that it? Yeah, I think that's it for me. Other than like getting harassed by the official ratchet. Yeah, <laughs> we bumped into in the line um, to PSX. I'm yeah. not sure if we mentioned that before. Uh, so I was not gonna put my. I, I mean, I had the base of my costume on because my my costume is clank built into it, and it's actually a wing harness. Um, if you've ever seen costumes with really big wings, uh, I built that to thread actually through my shirt. So I was wearing a regular shirt underneath. And then I put 
the um, the costume on over that so I could like clean um, and I had to have a shirt I could put in the wash. Um, so Clank actually gets threaded through the actual ratchet shirt. There are holes, like there are hidden holes in the back. Um, so it's a full harness on me to, to like evenly distribute the weight property properly. So I had that on, but I didn't have like the gloves or the head on outside while waiting to get into PSX. And then suddenly rounding the corner is the official costume person and their handler. And yeah. he's just sort of like arms crossed, uh, obviously not. You're like, dude. What the hell? Yeah, like, like, like when there's two women at a an Oscar party who are wearing the same dress. <laughs> 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 who wore it better? Yeah. <laughs> he didn't have a clank, but um, I, I, per, my personal opinion between the two of us, the the head sculpt of the official costume is way better than mine. Yeah, it is much more accurate to what you have in the game. So they probably used the game files to yeah. uh, make that. But, I mean, I built mine on my kitchen table for a... <laughs> out Which of... explains why it looks like a potato. Hey, 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 <laughs> hey, hey. Um, also, I built mine with, with other constraints in mind, like being able to flatten it to put it in a suitcase. I think I'm going to call it a night. Um, yeah, I think that wraps it up for yeah. <laughs> episode double digit 10 yeah, of so uh, that was... the Lunar Observer, the... Um, the intermittent podcast focused on Somniac Games, the creators of Spyro, Ratchet, Resistance, and um, Disruptor. <laughs> and we totally didn't forget the intro. No. Um, well, we did an intro. We yeah. did an intro at PSX. I know, but I forgot that bit. Yeah. You are... Oh, I'm sorry. I am Division 10. And I am Kebabs. And that is it for today. We'll see you... Well, I guess we'll see you in the bumper episode. Yeah. So, um, again, this is the third time this has happened. Bumper yeah. episode. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure we've explained this. I'm concluding the episode. Okay. Yeah. Go for it. All right. We'll end now.